the other ways that we're talking about media um, right now. So we argue that an assemblage of social forces, including um, media, conflated reopening uh, the 2020 NCAA college football season with the desire to return to normal. Um, thus sport or football has become a social factor that has enormous potential to create a syndemic between COVID and the other known health issues that disproportionately impact black student athletes on college campuses. So, oh, that's not gonna work, you're gonna do it with this. Okay, so um, a syndemic is when two epidemics are created or exacerbated by a social factor. Um, this must involve both a bio-bio interaction between the two disease entities, as well as an exacerbation by a social factor or the biosocial interaction. For example, someone in experiences violence um, may become depressed and prescribed antidepressant medication that leads to rapid weight gain, subsequently then developing diabetes type 2, um, which is an example provided by Emily Mendenhall um, from 2012. And so this framework was originally proposed by anthropologists. I don't have the phone. Meryl Singer, in relation to substance abuse, violence, and AIDS, which Singer called Saba. Who is it? Um, but since oh. then, the framework experienced a resurgence in interest due to the work of his students, including Nicola Bullard and Bela Ostrach at um, Boston University, and because of Emily oh. Mendenhall's work on diabetes and global mental health. Um, however, more recently, uh, just a couple of months ago, Gravely um, argued that we might be seeing a new syndemic between racism and COVID um, unfolding in the United States. However, they did not consider football or sport more generally as a component of their analysis. Um, known health disparities in the Black community include higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, chronic lung disease, and liver cirrhosis, according to Williams and Stearns all 2010. Um, and the first three are known to increase risks of severe COVID symptoms. Um, so we also know that um, Black Americans are dying in higher numbers than their white counterparts. Now, demonstrating a syndemic interaction um, is quite difficult to do and is often done retrospectively. Therefore, this paper is a prospective consideration of the potential for creating a syndemic through pressures to return to in-person elite level sport participation. We conceive of the pressures to return as an assemblage of corporate media um, that contributed to the conflation of the return to normal American life with sport. Um, in particular, NCAA college football has come to signify normalcy during the pandemic. This is evidenced in the presidential pressure on the Big Ten to open their football season, along with the SEC and the ACC. Indeed, several NAS colleagues, including Nathan Kalman Lamb, have uh, covered the attempt at normalcy in college football extensively in uh, multiple op-eds, as well as their end of sport podcast. Therefore, the assemblage of media narratives of, of sport and normalcy serve as our social factor in this endemic where the bio-bio interactions come from known health disparities impacting Black Americans that are now risk factors for COVID or severe COVID-19 complications. So hypertension, diabetes, and chronic lung conditions such as asthma, all of which again are associated with these severe symptoms. Therefore, there is both a defined interaction, however loosely uh, as new data emerges, between the biological disease interactions within Black communities in the U.S. Um, that are now then also facing potential additional exacerbation via the social factor of sport. We contend that this argument is especially relevant to the NCAA sporting context at all levels of competition because of the demographic database, which shows that Black student athletes make up 32% of the entire student athlete population. So uh, about, let's see, the entire population in 2019 was 6,414, so that's about 2,075 students. Um, we argue that there are some specific things that are not very well addressed publicly beyond the known health complications for the Black community that are relevant to this argument, um, including the long-term effects for COVID-19, because even in mild cases, um, some people who recover are experiencing up to at least one to two um, continued per and persistent experiences of symptoms um, for months and months beyond their initial experience with the disease and long after testing negative. There are some evidence that athletes recovering from COVID-19 are later developing myocarditis, which can result in sudden cardiac death. And then thirdly, that even if Black athletes and athletes more generally are not at risk for severe symptoms, um, asymptomatic athletes also have high potential 
to spread to their family members, which could exacerbate the COVID interactions with other existing diseases in their families and home communities. So therefore, if we think not about the syndemic interaction as happening now, but the potential for the ways that long-term effects of COVID might affect people, we have evidence that there's some type of long-lasting effect in the form of myocarditis in athletes that are otherwise healthy. And so there's not only this problem that we're affecting um, people in the ways that will make them unable to compete in the arena where they can finally, you know, either continue to be a, a college athlete within the NCAA or um, to potentially move on to the next level of professional play. Um, even in a situation where myocarditis is not immediately dangerous, it has this potential to be. Um, and has this potential also then to lead to them not being able to remain in their current competitive career as a college athlete or then completely ruin any chances of going on into the professional leagues. Um, so this is the immediate possible consequence, but the longer term consequence of this potential syndemics are more concerning. If we know that there are potential long term effects of this disease. Um, and of course, we still really don't know exactly how long because we're still <laughs> figuring out what the long term looks like. Um, but we also know that black men especially but also black americans generally have higher rates of chronic disease lower physical rates or lower rates of physical activity and just generally worse health behavior participation and lower life expectancy um, then we understand that there's also this um, role of stress playing into all of these things so all of these things working together then we are looking at a situation where we would be knowingly put pe putting people at risk of having another long-term complication and therefore setting them up for a syndemic interaction later related to multiple co comorbidities um, and a further exacerbation through the experience of institutionalized racism. So in sum, we're interested in introducing the syndemics framework to the field of sports sociology for the purpose of considering the very serious potential for interrelated negative health outcomes among athletes during the COVID-19 pandemic. And while we acknowledge that there are many theoretical approaches one could take to address these concerns, we think this might be the best framework. Um, syndemics helps clarify the potential disease interactions in relation to social factors as we think through the problems we're going to be facing for the next several years if we're going to just say, we want to return to normal, let's play football. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And I was going to suggest we hold our questions um, to the end so we can have a robust discussion and everyone has time. And Tori did make it in, I know, with all the confusion and the technical problems. Um, that are the groups gone through that there's been a lot of problems with that but fortunately they are all worked out and tori thompson from the university of maryland is here and she's going to present to us fear freaks and fat phobia an examination of how my 600 pounds life displays quote unquote fat black women yeah so let me see and sorry for the i went on hiatus and didn't have my email open for some strange reason. Um, so I wasn't able to get the new Zoom link, but I'm here. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay, can you, do you see the slides or do you see my script? You see the slides? Okay. Um, so hopefully I can work both of these. Um, so my name is Tori Thompson <clears throat> and I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, and like uh, Dr. Walsh says, my, this paper um, is entitled Fear, Freaks, and Fat Phobia, an examination of how my 600-pound life <clears throat> displays obese Black women. So let me see if I can, how do I move to the next one? Okay, good. Um, so this paper examines, um, in a nutshell, how Black women are represented on the Learning Channel, which is TLC's My 600 Power Life, and explores the underlying racist and sexist rhetoric that is reproduced within the reality television series. Um, it also illustrates how the constant portrayal of Black women as freaks, and I often use freaks in quotes, but... <clears throat> And, um, and I'll explain why, um, is not only used to incite fat phobia, but also reflect societal attitudes that fuse anti-fatness with anti-blackness. 
Um, so the show TLC's this reality vision, uh, reality television series, My Six Hundred Pound Life, um, is a broadcast that follows a year in the life of individuals who weigh at least six hundred pounds, which is two hundred and seventy kilograms. Participants on the show reside in various cities across the United States, but all seek the help of Houston-based Iranian American bariatric surgeon, Dr. Yanin Nalzardin. We call him Dr. Now, or they call him Dr. Now on the show. Uh, the participant's primary goal is to receive weight loss surgery via gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. Okay, and though the objective is for participants to receive gastric surgery and achieve long-term weight loss, the show reports that the chances of this are actually less than 5%. So on the surface, M6L's premise is simple, is to document, is to document participants' year-long weight loss journey. In doing so, however, M6L, My 600 Pound Life, perpetuates fat stigma through the infrequent of its participants. So infrequent, uh, as coined by critical feminist disability scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson, um, emerges from the cultural rituals that stylize, silence, differentiate, and distance the persons whose bodies the freak hunters or showmen colonize and commercialize. So the freak then represents a cultural other whose bodily deviance is constantly uh, flaunted as a product of their marginalized intersectional identity. So to this point, while My 600 Pound Life features participants belonging to various demographic uh, groups and backgrounds, this article in particular complicates how My 600 Pound Life captures the lived experience of um, fat Black women uh, as their relation to fatness is particularly extensive and contested. Um, so two points I would like to clarify in this presentation is my use of um, fat and black. And so this part, this, and this is where I'm kind of <clears throat> on the fence. So this, I've put this and positioned this article um, and situated it in the traditions of fat studies and black feminist theory. So fat studies, um, I use the term fat rather than obese in this language choice. Um, follows that tradition um, in fat studies, which uh, positions fat as a, as a size descriptor and not a, a derogatory term that implies disease or pathology like obesity does. Um, and black um, in this paper is um, denoted as with a capital B because I'm talking about black as in a cultural group. And it's important for me to make this distinction because this is a media analysis. So I couldn't go in and actually ask the participants whether they identify as black. So I kind of had to use those, um, these different markers and signifiers uh, to qualify them for this study and for this data. Um, <clears throat> and so again, the relationship between fatness and blackness has been long and contested. And Black feminist scholars in particular have highlighted and illuminated how historical tropes, per, these per historical tropes persist in the media. Um, and the most frequent tropes discussed in the field of media are the wanton Jezebel and the fat mammy depicted here. So the um, fat mammy in particular uh, is an image constructed by white slave owners who wish to keep their slaves in line. And I have them featured here. Um, and though these tropes were and continue to be imperative to the current philosophies that utilize Blackness to instill a fear of fatness uh, or fat phobia, Sabrina Strings here suggests that the fat phobia or the phobia of fatness uh, and the preference for thinness have not principally or historically been about health. Instead, they have been uh, one way the, that the body has been used to craft and legitimate race, uh, sex, and class hierarchies. So in her investigation, which I used throughout this article, Strings traces the fluidity of societal notions of corporealence and discusses how the racial discourse of fatness not only denigrates Black women, but also serves as the driver for the creation of slenderness as the proper form uh, of embodiment for elite white Christian women. So in this regard, the construction of the fat Black woman was, simi uh, was simultaneously operated uh, or simultaneously operates to degrade black women and discipline white women. So in this point is really critical to the argument as the visual image being, this is a media analysis, the visual image of the fat black woman and the construction of fat phobia is integral to the creation of white American femininity. <clears throat> 
So informed by these dichotomies presented by streams, this paper and this project examines how My 600 Pound Life Catcher displays and sensationalizes the lived experience of its fat black female participants while exploring how the medium of reality television operationalizes freakery to further the reproduction of racist narratives that associate black women with fatness. Um, theoretically, um, theoretically, I ground this article um, in, within the Foucauldian framework. So I read My 600 Pound Life as a powerful, it says my screen sharing is paused. Can you guys still see me? Okay. For some reason, when I switch, it says my screen sharing is paused. So I hope you guys can still see the slide. You're good. Um, okay. Okay, gang. Thanks. Um, so it says, um, so what was I saying? So I situate this project um, within the Foucauldian framework. So I read My 600 Pound Life as a powerful normalizing intervention that simultaneously mobilizes fat phobia through the infrequent of race, sex, and disabled bodies while providing sensational freak show spectacle to the to the viewers. Um, My, 600 pound, My 600 Pound Life falls under a genre of reality television that functions as a technique of governmentality, which I refer to um, according, if I inform, which I refer to and I'm informed by Olette and Hay as a cultural technology by which, by which viewers are shown bad behaviors and are encouraged to guide their own conduct through surveillance and self-monitoring self -monitoring to desirable ends. So in this way, um, I kind of purport my 600 pound life as a cultural technology that's concerned with the conduct of conduct, but more importantly, the direction of conduct as it defines fatness with a shaming and stigmatizing discourse and steers viewers to a more um, appropriate direction. Um, so thus, my 600 pound life kind of provides a model for viewers to use in policing and monitoring their own behaviors. Um, so my methods, I began my investigation with the following questions. Um, one, what race, gendered, and disabled body discourses are perpetuated in my 600 pound life? And what do those discourses say about the relation between blackness and fatness? So to answer these questions, I transcribed, coded, analyzed every episode of my 600 pound life, which equated to about 21 and a half hours that featured black women. So my end was 15. And this is at the time, so there are more um, episodes now. Um, yeah, I think it's about two more seasons. <clears throat> yeah, two more seasons, but this, um, but my N is 15 for this project. Um, and I accessed them via Hulu, so I was able to, you know, go in there, rewind, pause, and like watch them a couple of times. Um, my findings are presented in the form of cautions rather than themes for this project, as caution best illustrates the stories that the viewers are told in order to better guide their behavior. So my first caution <clears throat> or result uh, for this project is that fat black women are freaks. Um, and I came to this caution because the first scene that is displayed in my 600 pound life is the bed bath scene. Um, and that is always the first scene that's displayed on this show. And to be featured on the show, participants must agree to actually be filmed fully nude while taking a bath. Um, and this is problematic because as we see for the black women, many of the women cannot bathe themselves or many of the people in the show can't bathe themselves. And they actually require the assistance of others, but mainly their children who live with them. Um, <clears throat> so I came to this caution as I examined the bed bath scene. And this bed bath scene is a powerful cultural technology as it depicts in a spectacularized way the barriers uh, of being fat. <clears throat> or super fat in this case. And the quotes here highlight the participants need uh, of assistance from their children. So you guys can take a minute to read that. And just a heads up, these quotes are kind of powerful. So there are, um, um, there are hints of sexual violence, um, it's heavily implied. Um, so just a PSA if you're kind of sensitive to that. Um, <clears throat> and what I, and the research that, per, the research that um, helped me uh, in, in which this uh, caution was constructed was the residual influence of racism in the freak shows. Um, and this bad path scene uh, kind of mobilizes its residual influence as viewers, as viewers um, watch and as these visual images capture the attention 
um, in a really spectacularized way, which really hints to the historical notion of these freak shows. And these freak shows are really spectacularized forms that were made famous in the streets of London, and they kind of came over to the United States. Um, what we call a circus now, so this is P.T. Barnum from um, famous Barnum and Bailey, um, and he got his claim to fame by using this slave. He bought this slave, Joyce Heath, and, um, and she kind of really set his career up. Um, and again, spectacularizing her um, to the right here. I don't know if you can see my, I don't know if you can see my arrows or not, but this is Tona Maria. She's another um, brown passing woman. It's not clear whether she was black or, um, or from the Latinx community, but she was black passing and she was um, whipped several times just to show how resilient her body was. So just the body and the notion and the underlying notions of of how strong or resilient these racial bodies are and how they can withstand such burdens um, was really a, a, a key aspect in these freak shows. So by the 20th century, then the freak in some ways was no longer an acceptable term, nor did it invoke marvel. So instead, these abnormalities, like these obesities um, or these fatnesses, uh, now became issues of what we call race or ethnicity. So we sort of align the, these freak show spectacles or these freak, uh, freak bodies uh, and underline them with racial and gendered rhetoric. And we continue to see the fat black woman in these spectacles of freakery um, in reality shows such as My 600 Pound Life. So my second caution here um, is that young black women are freaks in the sheets. And this caution, um, is a culmination of Patricia Hill Collins' Black Sexual Politics, where she talks about um, how the justification of sexual violence towards Black women is rooted within um, is rooted within historical context um, for white white men during the chattel slavery kind of constructed these ideals that kind of justify the belonging and sexual possession of a Black woman's body. And so here the show kind of highlights these sexual indiscrepancies and these sexual harassments and these molestations as reasons for them actually eating. So it was a form of coping. Food was how they dealt with these traumas. So again, this is just an overview of what I've just talked about, the impact of the freak stigma. And just because I know I'm a little short on time, I can want to get to this point about how the 20th century freak, Patricia Hill Collins highlights how the freaks of nature kind of uh, continue through society, but not as a natural animalistic thing, but as more so as a, um, as it, as we portray it in popular culture, but as a justification for sexual and domestic violence against Black women. So she talks about Missy Elliott's Get Your Freak On and Rick James's Super Freak as kind of this, uh, that's kind of this notion that's saying like Black women, you don't have to have your sexual prowess uh, kept under wraps any longer. So it kind of really permeates society as if Black women are these freaky individuals and thus their bodies are, um, can be possessed by others. So in my discussion, I talk about how My 600 Pound Life simultaneously draws upon and reinforces historical tropes that are grounded in racism and sexism. So I talk about the mammy and fat phobia. Um, and it encourages viewers to manage and self-surveil their own health behaviors. So, and while their purpose is to educate its audience and the effects of fatness, it does so by utilizing negative stereotypical images of Black women. So according to various studies, actually these methods of education, of education are, are quite ineffective as these messages of fatness have been reported to actually cause overweight individuals to disengage with this content and encourages more overeating with the individuals who they are trying to say, hey, um, and it's a very neoliberal message of <clears throat> like, this is too much or uh, talking about excessive weight or junk food. And it actually has the opposite effect on these individuals. And so I kind of conclude by saying in this paper that black women continue to be consumed as these fat freaks in the media in the relation, in the relation between attitudes of anti-fatness and anti Blackness um, becomes synonymous and they become fused, further align the fear of the fat body with uh, the fear of the black body. So uh, fat phobia within society is, is racially and morally coded, or better yet, is morally coded within these racial terms. So in this view, My 600 Pound Life reflects and strengthens and substantiates these prejudices um, against black women while pushing anti-fat narratives. 
I'm sorry, I know that was pretty quick, but I can send the notes from this. I feel as though I like went really, really, really fast, but but it's sake of time. I know it was late too. No worries. Thank you, Tori. That was am that was fantastic. Um, yeah, I think everybody really enjoyed that. Um, so we have a, a two more sets of speakers, but I'm going to introduce them together because it's part of a united project, and then um, I'll let them sort of separate how they're going to talk about it. The two papers are Woke Advertising and Political Authenticity, YouTube Response to Nike Ads, and Analyzing the Response to Nike's Woke Advertising, Does It Have Meaning? Uh, the authors are Christian Garcia, Eric Chan, Rogelio Munoz, Josh Diaz, Be uh, Beverly Cotter, and myself, Phelan Wax. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to um, Christian, Eric, and Josh. All right, uh, the PowerPoint slide, right? All right, um, so good morning. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I feel a bit self-conscious about talking to a bunch of people who are definitely much more well-versed in this topic than I am. But um, today, I want the three of us want to talk essentially about Nike and Nike and woke advertising in general. So essentially to begin with, uh, I'd like to ask Josh to essentially give us a sort of like background of why we would want to look into Nike. Like what sort of like factors do they have to other corporations we can look at though that incentivize us to look at this? All right, thank you, Eric. Good morning, so Nike. It's a multi-billion dollar company with a huge global influence. Yet yeah, they they currently sponsor the NFL and NBA with uniforms, as well as they sponsored the sport of soccer and basketball to design the uniforms for the 2020 Olympics. They spent over $3 billion per year on advertising alone since 2014. And in the last World Cup, they partnered with 14 soccer teams uh, to be their sole sponsor. Um, they, Nike has employed many social conscious marketing values in a lot of their ads. Since the 1980s, they have been putting women in sports, ableism, and HIV prevention, as well as in 1994, they signed Mia Hamm and Michael Jordan as um, salary employees. And in 2018, they signed Colin Kaepernick, uh, for a Just Do It campaign because of his kneeling controversy, as well as they also sponsor 100 high schools in the state of Oregon alone to quote unquote, increase their graduation rates. Now, Nike is not completely blameless with the 2011 documentary that came out called Behind the Swoosh that showed their factory workers make $1.25 per day, you know, and that's not a livable wage at all. So it just shows that Nike has developed multiple identities that they switch through depending on their field of play. Uh, yeah, so given that context, uh, I think we've established pretty well, and I think you guys well know that Nike is an incredibly influential company that has a capability of interacting in our public sphere in a way that many other corporations honestly don't right now. So we wanted to look at essentially how has Nike established its role? It, it, this sort of like inf it, this sort of influential role, and the way it's done so, in large part, has been its use of socially conscious marketing, where it aligns its it, it aligns the goods that it sells with the consumer's norms, values, and beliefs. So while the earliest use of the successful use of this was promoting world peace with Coca Cola, Nike took a slightly different spin on this in the 1980s and started what start uh, sorry began using woke marketing. And this is where they appeal directly to anti-racist values while ignoring the, their own contributions to systemic racism. So what's interesting about Nike is while woke advertising in general has seen some variance in its effect, such as when 20, in 2017, Pepsi released their uh, Live For Now ad featuring Kendall Jenner, um, we have seen that these some ads fail, but Nike's ad woke advertising has, conce has succeeded. In 2018, when they signed Colin Kaepernick, this was seen to be one of the best ad campaigns, woke ad campaigns of the time, and it increased their stock value to record highs. 
So according to Professor Montes de Oca, who I'm pretty sure is in here, uh, woke advertising appropriates aspects of political activism to make brands to seem relevant and cool during periods of crisis and resistance to capitalism. Given the events that are happening outside and the current period of crisis and resistance to capitalism we certainly seem to be in right now, we thought it would be interesting to look at how has Nike tried to tackle or even co-opt the current events happening outside. So our methods, we analyzed one ad, one ad from three different time periods. The first ad was well before George Floyd's shooting in 2017, what would they say about you? The second ad was in the immediate aftermath to George Floyd's shooting for once just don't do it. And the third ad was You Can't Stop Us, which, has, which was released relatively recently, well after the George Floyd shooting faded from the mainstream media. So we applied a coding scheme for certain variables to 250 comments from each advertisement. These variables included the overall tone of the ad, any references to empowerment or emotion, and any references to racism, feminism, homophobia, capitalism, and etc. So I am just going to rat off the statistics that we found, and I'll get to the sort of takeaways that we found later. But for now, the positive responses to the ad increased with each successive advertisement, while the negative responses had significantly less variance and stayed about the same. Comments referencing feelings of personal empowerment and mocking empowerment both spiked during For Once Just Don't Do It, the ad released in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's shooting. So references to capitalism and random digressions about economics and the government all saw a slight increase during For Once Just Don't Do It. But there was a significant drop in racist comments between the first two ads and a slight increase in the third ad, but a significant and sustained increase in anti-racist comments with each successive advertisement. So essentially, there are three major takeaways that we have from this like sort of skimming of the data. The first is that Nike's messages have become increasingly successful in appealing to their target audiences over time. It appears that the messages that Nike have been throw, doling out have become closer to what the target audience is expecting from them or wanting from them in order to justify their uh, purchase of Nike's products. The second is that the response to ads appears to reflect an attitudinal shift in public opinion towards race, economics, and government. This seems natural given the current events that are happening outside with respect to race, economics, and government with the coronavirus and the continuation of the George Floyd protests. And finally, and this is the point with the most theoretical implications that Christian will get to in a little bit, For Once Just Don't Do It, the ad released in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's shooting, appears to have sparked response from people with more extreme left or anti-capitalist sentiments than Nike's intended audience. Um, so for more on that, uh, Christian. So my name is Christian Garcia, and my paper extends the ideas that Josh and Eric present by offering a critical analysis of Nike's woke advertising and political authenticity. Uh, my paper is rooted in the works of Antonio Gramsci, Noam Chomsky, and Stuart Hall. Um, so essentially, the increase in discourse surrounding police brutality and racial injustice has distinguished itself as a predominant subject in the mainstream media. Uh, we've already established how Nike uses progressive ads to ride waves of popular sentiment regarding women empowerment, LGBTQ plus rights, um, and AIDS awareness to maximize profits. And their ad, for once just don't do it, contains the same motivations. This ad was much more polarizing, sobering, and event-specific compared to previous ads that focused on visuals, empowerment, and production quality. It premiered just four days after the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020, along with the Black Lives Matter hashtag. So why are these events important in the lens of critical theory, particularly when discussing the maintenance of a hegemonic market structure? Well, it's important because utilizing ideology is crucial to maintaining civil society's consent to the market. Protests like the ones following the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd serve as examples of how certain ideologies can enter into the mainstream. In other words, what do consumers find important at the moment, and how can corporations make use of these perspectives? So essentially, by aligning themselves with the morals and values that are embedded within progressive ideologies, Nike is able to appeal to a particular consumer base by shifting the narrative from product superiority to the moral superiority of the brand. It's not so much a question of whether or not their shoes are better than Adidas or will help you win the game, at, uh, win at the end of the game. It's more a question of whether or not Nike is on the right side of history or on the people side uh, in general. So in a sense, woke advertising maintains hegemony because it dictates the market as the ultimate pragmatic route towards social change. 
individuals think that buying products from a woke corporation will advance some, si some sort of progressive agenda or alleviate injustices that they see in society. And the upward trend in positive reception that we see motivates Nike to continue aligning themselves with these ideals through more progressive ad campaigns. So positive comments such as, thank you for using your platform to inform people about the horrific tragedies that happen every day. Or because Nike promotes equality, I will continue to buy your shoes. See, these comments sound nice, but they fail to grasp that by continuing to purchase these products, consumers consent to a market structure that devalues black lives and ultimately creates the conditions that allow racial injustice, inequality and prejudice to flourish. For the master's tools will never diminish or will never dismantle the master's house. So what happens when Nike's market, market motivations do get called out? As Eric mentions, the increase in anti-capitalist sentiment found in Just Don't Do It compared to their 2017 ad, What Will They Say About You, is epitomized in dense comments like, remember this is coming from a corporation. They're happy to virtue sig signal using vapid and broad statements of let's stand together or whatever, but how much of their almost 40 billion have they put to good use for the cause? None. This is a scam to make like Nike look good. They're not. So in essence, this raises an important question regarding how a hegemon can navigate threats to its legitimacy, because denouncing capitalism is not the same as denouncing racism, bigotry, or, um, or sexism, uh, because doing so would be unsustainable and contradictory to maximizing profits. So unable to win over the consumer base that leans further to the left, Nike turns their attention back towards traditional messages found in liberal progressivism. You see, two months after this ad, Nike released You Can't Stop Us, which reverted away from radical points of view. It did not maintain the Black Lives Matter hashtag and focused more on visuals and a general message of inclusivity or, or empowerment. And this ad gave Nike the best of both worlds, high positive comments and low anti-capitalist sentiment. Uh, Nike has the best ads, one commenter said, while another one relayed about uh, the fact that they loved how Nike showcases not only the American sport culture, but the humanity and positivity of America as well. So it remains to be seen exactly what type of uh, ad campaign Nike employs next, but their actions showcase how appealing to discourse within the acceptable ideological boundaries of the political spectrum is critical to their market success. It's also important to remember that Nike is just one corporation out of hundreds that employ similar tactics. But their name recognition and ability to purport ideology through their ads distinguishes themselves as a key player within the market. So as racial and economic tensions continue to fluctuate alongside calls for social justice and the effects of the coronavirus, it's important to recognize how our voices can be turned against us as mechanisms for profit. By doing so, the path forward uh, towards true structural change can be maintained, not through the assistance of corporations, but through, the but through the intellectual mobilization of awareness surrounding the consequences of the political economy itself. And that is our paper. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. All right, thanks everybody. So um, I think we have a small enough group that we can like go for it in terms of a, a Q and A, um, or you can type it in the chat and I'm trying to move things around so I can actually see what's going on. Awesome. Um, so you can either type your question in the chat or raise your hand or go ahead and speak up. Any questions? I have one for the last group. All right, thank you, Caitlin. Um, thanks so much for your talk. It was really fun to hear everybody's um, perspective. But a lot of what you guys were sharing made me think about Sammy King's work on Pink Ribbons, Inc. and the, philanthropo the, the corporate philanthropy um, game, right? Where you have uh, companies that are directly contributing to, like Avon, um, where you're directly contributing to risks of breast cancer through the products that you market to women, but on the back end, you're encouraging them to continue buying your products uh, through the pink washing ads that are saying, you know, buy this product and we'll just donate so much of it to um, breast cancer research. So I was just really curious if you had um, looked at any potential similarities in those 
it was both of those processes because it, it sounds very similar and it's really, really interesting to see it happening in a different area. Yeah. And so, if you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No worries. Um, so I haven't heard of that specifically, but I definitely do find that interesting. I think that, um, you know, in the world that we have today, there's kind of a veil over like what we see on the internet and on social media, and then what actually goes on in the, um, in our actual everyday material interactions. So we might agree with something or see something that we really like on TV think one thing and then we go out and act a totally different way, you know, or perceive things in a totally different way um, because we're not st sh staring at the screen anymore. So I think that, you know, in that sense, that's something that corporations are kind of starting to understand. You know, I think that one thing, you know, when we start thinking about the market is the idea that um, corporations are also always looking for profit, you know, and they're always going to see things before, the rest of us kind of understand what they're doing. And by that time, it's kind of too late. Um, and so, yeah, I'll definitely look into, did you say Sammy King? Yeah, I just put it in the, um, in the chat for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, Sammy King. Um, I mean, it, I guess at this point, it's showing my age because it's a little bit old at this point, but then I just see so many parallels. It's really, it's really cool to see it. And your analysis is great. Yeah, yeah I'll definitely take a look. At it. Yeah. Oh, Faye, I think you're muted. So um, questions, more thoughts or comments? observations hopes i like the way you can kind of tell everyone oh jeff montes de oka's hand is up so let's hear from jeff okay so oh, let me lower my hand I, I, i've got like a thing about people leaving their hands up in class so i'm like constantly lowering students hands um actually in our faculty meetings i lower my my colleagues hands too so um yeah all the presentations were great uh i actually want to direct a question towards tori um, so when, when you were, when you were talking about the, the more historical use of the term freak, uh, immediately what came into my mind was Houdini's song, Freaks Come Out at Night. And then you did talk about, you know, Rick James is super freak and I forget the other song that you, you mentioned. And so there's this real, there, there's a, there's a clear connection between the more historical use of freak and the use of freak in these songs and you know and i i was i'll, I'll age I'm, i'll age myself as even older than caitlin uh back in the 80s uh we we used the term freak all the time um as as it was used in the music uh which is sort of like a positive negative i think it has both simultaneously positive and negative connotations and i was wondering if you could kind of fill in because i know you have to, to go through your talk quickly fill in that kind of genealogy or the change between the sort of historical meaning of freak as aberration from nature, but connected to nature um, and negative to the more contemporary meaning of freak, because the linkages seem pretty clear in some ways, but in other ways, but how did, how did that like happen? Well, as a, a lot of my work comes from Patricia Hill Collins gives a very detailed in her Black Sexual Politics um, about the, the, the historical freak from being this very savage, natural, animalistic to this very sexualized notion um, of freak. And we see this permeation, we see this come out um, um, in her discussion where she talks about how the black culture reclaiming this word freak as it as it echoes freedom and just women in general like so so to be freak kind of echoes notions of of, of freedom to no longer have to be kept um under wraps and she talks about how these these popular culture songs like rick james or um uh, to be like very freaky girl or just these different songs like in our day-to-day -day language just kind of 
more so solidifies this this very sexualized freak but the historical freak that the that was established 350 years ago and she talks about the slave owners that freak was also sexualized but it was a different type of sexualized it was like they were forced to be sexualized like they were being freaked upon right they weren't like the agents of freaks right they were being freaked upon um and 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 and, and she also talks about like their lack uh, of intimacy right so she talks about they just instinctually mate right and she just talks about the how these um white western uh observers she calls them just uh basically landed in Africa and just saw how they just instinctually freak. Like there's no romance, there's no intimacy, there's no other reason other than their animalistic impulses. Um, and so we kind of see this permeation and she talks about how this, this, this new freak could just solidifies different sexual violences, but she also, on the flip side, she talks about how it's very liberating and it echoes those notions of freedom for women. Um, and so sexuality, the power of sexuality which I could have gone further into, but just the power of sexuality. Um, I guess it's different based off who you ask, but we definitely see the, the, a more acceptable version of freak, which really isn't acceptable because someone on the flip side of that, uh, you know, it's like that positive negative, right? Somebody's going to be negatively impacted on the flip side of that. Thanks. So, um, yeah, and I was going to throw a, a question back at Caitlin, building on that, because I, you see this sort of connection between Tori and um, Caitlin's work with this idea of, um, of this cultural presentation of Black bodies and this sort of external imposition of meaning onto other bodies that are serving this a larger financial system. So I was wondering if Caitlin could also comment on that same historical imposition of ideas about risk and black male bodies and what, uh, I think Tori sort of also had raised this a little bit when she was talking about the history as, history as well, or, and also Jeff in his um, uh, presidential address earlier, right, is that sort of presumption of, of that, that black bodies can take more, and then what does that mean when you're looking at college football and race and uh, syndemics? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. Um, I mean, that makes me think back to a colleague of mine here, um, Rana Hogarth's work on slavery era medicine, um, and she call, it's called Medicalizing Blackness. I actually have it right here because I've been working on it. for some, This is a really, really good book. Medicalizing Blackness, uh, Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World from 1780 to 1840. And I mean, I just think that this, what's really troubling is that this just really seems to be a, con a, a very strong continued thread of this assumption that uh, young men, but especially young black men, can are are um, just you know invincible, um, and we play to that through sports like football already, and we were already seeing problems with that with the concussion crisis. But this is a, just a whole nother level of problems. I mean, not that concussions, I mean, you know, the CTE and TBI stuff is, a, is very serious as well. Um, but this is just a whole nother host of problems because we, um, we just don't know what the long term looks like. And that's really scary when, when you start to think, well, you know, it doesn't matter because I'm invincible. Um, and and um, the ways that the, the corporate component of that in, in higher education is encouraging that kind of thinking and, and saying, you know, it, that you're going to be okay. Um, and, and it's also, of course, complicated by there are a lot of athletes that really do want to return to play because that's a big part of their identity. But um, I think the historical component, yeah, is, is the thing that's most, um, well, it's the scariest because you know, sometimes we've been encouraged in some cases to, to view things as a post-racial society. And this is another example where it's just so clearly not the case. Yeah, thanks for that. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, updates on doom scrolling, whatever? Uh, I had a question for uh, Tori. Um, so I know that you said that you only coded for ads specifically featuring uh, Black women in the show, but I was wondering, did you notice any differences in how they characterize Black fatness and white fatness? And do you think that's a 
sort of area that you might want to look into for what you're trying to answer? Mm -hmm. So how I understand your question is that uh, I'm not saying that black fatness and white fatness are two different things, right? I'm saying that I code it for black women because there's extensive, you know, literature about the relationship between fatness, fat phobia, and blackness. Um, and like I said, there are, there are, now what I did find, so I don't find any difference between, you know, black fatness and white fatness, uh, specifically on the show, but we do see different expressions of those who may identify as white or those who are white passing and different privileges that although they're both 270 kilograms, right, we see these different, uh, expressions and fatness manifests itself differently, especially for if I were to compare, at first I started this study comparing white men wearing 600 pounds to the black women. And those men were still very much privileged, right? They had wives, whereas a lot of the black women were single mothers. The white men still had wives. They still had their, um, so they had different levels of assistance. Um, so they weren't dependent upon their children or so black women were more dependent upon their children they were more likely to be single um and they still in their mannerisms i, I kind of started with these quotes where they talked about well you can still bring me my food like they still possess this type of hyper masculinity about themselves that was still pretty much toxic right whereas a lot of the black women surprisingly once they actually started losing weight if they were married or had a boyfriend or a spouse or a partner that partner left them because um, because they kind of liked, they were like, well, you're supposed to be big. I liked you like this, right? Whereas the black men, I mean, were, whereas the white men, when they lost weight, they found great jobs, right? They, they kind of, their masculinity was now even more intense, right? And so, so those are the differences. If I were to, if I were to claim a difference between white and black, that would be it between the white men on the show and the black women and just how though you're, though they're both getting disability checks, both they're, you know, they're immobile, both they're in these situations, you can still see these expressions of blackness and whiteness play out in these type, type of juxtaposed ways. Thank you, that's really illuminating. Um, if I could ask a question or kind of just um, ask actually Caitlin, um, I just had an idea that I wanted to kind of off and see if you had anything to say. Um, going off of this idea about how sports is kind of used as a way to, you know, go back to normal and like, you know, puts Black Lives at risk, you know, in um, kind of in favor for our entertainment. Do you see any type of difference in like, if we have the institution of sport, obviously there's football, basketball, college football, and they all have different types of cultures and different ideas around, you know, what type of violence or what kinds of um, kinds of conditions or en uh, environments, you know, are present during those. So when I think about it, it's like football, obviously you think about the violence or, or not the violence, but, you know, possibility for concussions and injuries and stuff. But I remember um, after the NBA bubble finished, you know, a lot of players talked about the psychological aspects of having to be in a bubble and be away from their families for four months. And at the end of it, if you didn't, you know, win the championship, what was it kind of all for? I guess you could kind of argue that it was that some people use it as a platform for social justice, you know, and that's something positive in itself. But I guess, is there anything that you see in terms of how, you know, different sports have different cultures within themselves, you know, and how that kind of contributes and, you know, plays off of each other, I guess, and the overall idea that you convey? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to take this? Because I see you nodding, and I feel like this is something that you could speak to really well here if you'd like to. Yeah. Um, you know, I definitely think there are different cultures between sports, but also the, the different um, like levels of sport, right? So I think professional athletes have a certain platform that, you know, may enable them to um, like take stances on social justice um, or not, um, you know, compared to college athletes. Um, you know, college athletes are, are in this institutionalized space. Most of them live on campus. Um, you know, they, they, they work there, they go to school there. Um, so work being like, you know, the sport, right? Um, and there's this, this power dynamic, um, not to say there isn't one in the professional sports, but I think it's greater in college sport. Um, and so, you know, just kind of touching on this idea of being able to use your platform to talk about um, social justice issues. Um, you know, I'm, 
I'm actually, you know, kind of looking into this myself, but I'm, I'm interested in how um, comfortable um, college athletes feel. And if the, if, you know, that being a college athlete um, versus being a professional athlete affects the, um, how vocal you can be about certain issues, depending on how your university feels, how your coach feels, um, you know, um, I think um, professional athletes have a, a different, um, a different status, um, which, you know, I think may change, um, may change that. Um, so that was the, the social justice um, aspect of it. And then the first part, sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Oh, I can go back to that part. We okay. were asking about like the, you know, you started to ask about the different cultures across sports and, um, and you brought up the, the idea that there's a mental health component for the NBA bubble. And absolutely, actually, that's what's interesting about the syndemics framework is the majority of the established syndemics are specifically involving mental illness in some way. Um, as a consequence of the syndemic, if not um, part of the original um, interacting epidemics. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely some component of that. We went for the football example, mostly because it involves a larger number of student athletes, just be by the nature of the sport, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, unique to football by any means. Thank you. I'm following my class rule, right? You got to wait like a few seconds to let people formulate <laughs> their thoughts. So any other thoughts or questions or um, things that people would like to add to the discussion or share from um, what they've observed or even their own research? Can I ask Tori one more question? Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, because I put it in the chat, but I did actually want to hear if, if there's time, because um, I asked about um, the interdisciplinary, or well, not, sorry, not interdisciplinary, um, intersectional disability studies approach. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I feel like there's so many potentials. I didn't know where else you were going with your work, but do you see yeah. any potential for that? Well, this article, I use, this article is under review. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I use what Anna Malos, it's a fat black disability studies, it's a transdisciplinary methodology where I take fat studies, okay. critical disability studies, CRT, black feminist theory, and I kind of just mix it all up and say, here's the lived experience. You can't just take one or the other, or pick and choose because mm -hmm. they're entangled. Um, and so, yeah, so method, as it regards to methodology, I did have to kind of combine like intersect because true intersectionality, to do true intersectionality, you have to take these different disciplines and analyze it in these different lenses. So yeah, <laughs> which is hard because not a lot of not a lot of us do that, like and actually give them equal weight. Right. And that's another thing. You have to like I give them equal weight. So it's not like, well, be even so I'm not just like signposting and saying, well, this is critical disability, but and just leaving it there. Like they're very much prominent and very much, you know, very dialectic and mutually reinforcing. Super cool. Well, I'm excited to see you that come out in publication. Good Dang, luck. I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Because I actually had the same reaction when I was looking at your work. I was like, wow, there's so many great overlaps with um, disability studies as well, especially the quotes about with the, the, the requiring assistance and sort of the mm -hmm. framing mm -hmm. of assistance in this hierarchical model of like hum humanity, really. I mean, mm -hmm. that's surprisingly, and surprisingly, it calls out kind of that, con that like little, there's a contestation between like fat studies and disability studies because not everybody in disability studies considers obesity as a disability although it can be disabling <laughs> you know and, and that's a racial component because it's kind of exclusionary so it kind of echoes like that feminist critique like who gets to decide who is a woman is the same as who gets to decide who is disabled so i talk about these different power structures and limited to eight thousand words it needs to be a book <laughs> you know the true so yes <laughs> Well, um, right, I think from uh, your lips to the publisher's ears, you're absolutely right. It needs to be a book, and I look forward to reading it. Thanks. Speaking of books, <laughs> I have to make a plug here. Um, for, for those of you that are working on larger projects and you're looking for a place to, to publish on, you know, good sports scholarship, um, Rutgers 
Press, we have a, a series on critical issues in sports. So I would encourage you to, to keep our series in mind as you're, as you're thinking about your projects and take a look at what we've already published. Uh, we've done, I think, a lot of good, a lot of good scholarship and we're, we're always interested in new, new projects, especially um, research that's you know, empirically based, uh, theoretically smart and empirically based. And you can reach out to myself, to Michael Mesner, Doug Hartman, any of us, or the, or the uh, managing editor, P Peter Miklas. Do you support, do you look for like sporty? Cause I'm not very sporty. <laughs> I think that's one of my one of my like I'm like oh my gosh I always have to do like with publish within like communication journals because I'm not very sporty so I'm kind of making those like relations as to why this is Peter is like, open to body books yeah and, and I, I would say you would, you would frame it as physical culture yeah physical culture right yeah for sure and then I'll have to argue with Doug. <laughs> Although, you know, if you wanted to go down the road of sport, I mean, you could definitely do not for your dissertation because you have clearly enough to do already. But there's also, I mean, thinking about like um, sort of like some of Laura Chase's work on the um, the Clydesdale runners and like the other experiences of people identifying as fat runners, right? I mean, that's a not hugely touched area. There, there's a lot that could be unpacked there and definitely related to your work. Um, one last thing, if I can ask anyone who might have, you know, somebody to look into um, or just any thoughts regarding this idea. Um, I kind of came up with it while I was writing the paper um, that we presented on and it goes off of this idea about how you know, corporations are using, you know, progressive ideologies and like morals and values to, to appeal to consumers and how, you know, as consumers, we are being profiled, you know, they know so many things about us. And I find it really interesting because when I watch TV, the one ad that I see that's different is Apple. And Apple has a really big campaign right now that's based around privacy and based around the fact that, you know, oh, we're going to protect your information. We're not going to sell your information and stuff like that. And so I find it really interesting because we've, just established, you know, about, um, you know, how all these other corporations are kind of moving in the other direction where they want to know everything about you. And that's, that's their way of innovating the market. That's their way of, you know, using the market to sell products. But Apple is actually selling or starting to try to sell people this idea of privacy. So I'm kind of interested in it because I think that it creates this kind of dilemma or this kind of, you know, opposition to where Apple is a really big company, very big influential company. And I'm curious to see whether, you know, other companies follow suit and try to also market this idea of privacy. And if so, how that would conflict with the way that they have already been profiling consumers for so long, you know, what I'm just curious to see if anybody has any, you know, thoughts about the future of that or how Apple could have some kind of influence in you know, the general market of um, advertising and appealing to customers, I guess. Jeff. So I, I've thought about this uh, a bit and, and, and I know y'all read my article um, and, and I, so I, I actually talk about this idea in, in the article, although not specific to Apple. And, and I should say that this part of my analysis is really informed by a book called Body Panic. Um, you may have heard of this book and you, may have heard of the author, uh, Faye Linda Wax, uh, but it's the, so, so okay, so what's, what's the, the narrative structure of, of commercials, right? Crisis resolution, there's a crisis, um, you know, dirty dishes or something like that, and, um, and the dirty dishes are gonna lead to your neighbors thinking less of you, and so the solution is whatever, uh, dishwashing soap. And um, and then and then um, then the crisis is resolved, and and so the the commercial is promising, you know, 
a, a happy life, right? Or a complete life, that your life will be complete without the commercial, without the, without the product. But what the socially conscious marketing is doing is changing the location of the crisis. The crisis is not an individual crisis, it's a general social crisis. So global warming, uh, police violence, um, privacy. We all know we're all being hacked all the time. And it's not even hacking because it's built right into the, the technology that we use and we download and the free, you know, games that we play and this, you know, and all that kind of stuff, like the pro the horoscopy stuff and all those things. And so we're providing, we're giving away all this personal um, data for super cheap. And so Apple is providing the solution to that crisis. It's the exact same narrative structure, but it's exactly what you're talking about is driving the sales pitch for Apple. And, and I, I'm, an, I'm, on a, I'm, I'm talking to you on a MacBook. I've got an iPhone. I'm a like hardcore Apple user. And I'm under no illusion that Apple is not tracking <laughs> everything we do and selling our data. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I definitely think it's interesting because I feel like, you know, as we go on, it's kind of become normal. You know, you download an app and it gives you the terms and conditions and kind of it's like, yes, 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 let me use it, you know. And I don't know, I feel like I have a friend who is a computer science major, you know, so every time he signs up for anything or I talk about, you know, downloading app, he's like, oh, well, do you know this? Do you know this? And you know, the truth of the matter is that, you know, even us as social scientists, you know, we have an expertise and we have a general idea of certain things that go on. And for him, that's his area, you know? And so I just find it interesting because like I said, everybody has their own area of expertise and it seems like, you know, corporations, I guess, are able to see the holes, you know, and see the holes in the general. Um, and so I find it interesting to see how they are able to kind of take all the little bits and pieces of the things that we don't think about every day and create a big product, you know, a like wholesome product that bypasses some of those, um, I guess, kind of um, things that we're looking out for, I guess. Well, and when you put it in the context of what's happening right now with the election, right, is it's really easy to sort of talk about that group and also ignore what they're doing to us, but People are like, how on earth can people believe this? And I'm like, it's the same thing with advertising. This is advertising, right? It's like they have the neuroscience. They have all this data on us. They know exactly where our triggers are. And the way that advertising works, right, is to find that trigger, find that thing you're insecure about, find that fear, and then so that you're no longer thinking rationally. Well, you're not thinking rationally, but you are thinking predictably. When and you, it's right? really... It's a really powerful form of governmentality because it's first, they're beginning by studying us because advertisers realize by the 1920s that they can't create ideologies whole cloth, right? They, they can't just like, if, if, if advertising worked in the simple way that people like to think it does, you know, you'd watch one commercial and go out and buy, you know, they know that it doesn't work like that. And so they realize that they need to understand their market, you know, consumers within, the, we're not humans, we're consumers, we're not a group of people, we're a market. They need to understand people's everyday lives so they could fit the commodities within our everyday lives and speak to us given our needs, our anxieties, our frustrations, our hopes and our dreams. And so, and that's what they work with. And then in the 1980s, there's the turn towards experience. And reading the experience literature is fascinating because in the social sciences, we had a, in the US, we had a big postmodern turn in, you know, in the social sciences and humanities. Well, that's what the experience literature is. It's a, it's a postmodern turn in, in marketing. And so they turn to a lot of the same people we turn to but they're reading them in like the opposite direction as us, where we read that stuff to understand and critique these oppressive structures. They're reading that stuff to better know how to manage us. And, and that's why contemporary, a lot of contemporary commercials, it's like you watch the commercial, you don't even know what the thing is about. 
but it's really, it's about creating feelings and sensations and imagining a world. And that within that world is a lot of consumption. I would add to that since my husband is in film, they are specifically being trained that way, right? So because you come in to the film world as someone interested in doing narrative film, right? And, and being trained to tell those stories, but then you make your bread and butter in the film industry by working in advertising and marketing. And so then you have these skills that are supposed to have been developed for, you know, critical, amazing narrative films that are then being used for selling products. And they don't even have to be intentional about that. But a lot of them like, are. <laughs> well, I'm sure, no doubt. And especially by now, because I remember when I lived in Los Angeles, you know, if you live in Los Angeles, you meet industry people all the time. You go all, you know, it's like you can't swing a dead cat and, you know, <laughs> miss an industry person. So I was at a party and I was talking to a guy who, who was uh, film school trained, because I'd been in film school for my master's degree. And so we were talking and, and I was like, those crazy commercials, you know, he makes those artsy commercials. And I'm like, those crazy commercials, what the hell are they about? I mean, are you trying, and, and I like gave him the whole like litany of what the uh, people that write about um, lifestyle marketing says. He's like, oh, I don't care. I just want to make art and this is where I can do it. And it, yeah, that's and it fair. fits into the framework or else he would not get hired. But I would believe that now they're specifically trained in that. Thank you for all your input. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, so now I think we're budding up against the timeline, but if there's any closing thoughts, I think we have a little, we have a little time before we run to the next Zoom room, right? It's, uh, um, yeah, and I think probably everyone's feeling a little sad that we're not in New Orleans. I think we're all feeling very, very sad that we're not in New Orleans, goodness gracious. Um, and also in, person getting to feel the great energy of all the people that come to NAS and have, you know, make new connections and uh, maintain our old connections. But there's going to be a couple more great sessions today. And tomorrow morning, we have another wonderful uh, keynote. I think it's Rich, is it, it's Richard Lapchick tomorrow morning, I believe. And uh, tomorrow morning? I thought it was this afternoon. Oh, it's this afternoon. I, yeah, I maybe right after this, like this tells you where I was going to go look at the conference program next, but uh, yeah, it's going to be tomorrow morning too, right? I'm not crazy, or am I? Maybe I am. I have it at, uh, looks like 2.30 central time for today for Lapchick, unless I'm wrong. Oh yeah, so then, then, then sorry, we have Richard Lapchick later today, so I guess that's my afternoon plan, and um, we had a great presidential address this morning from Jeff. Um, which we all, and then we had, there was an, an, uh, Nancy Spencer yesterday with another great one. And um, I think like, if we can all reach out to Algerian and I know like this was, as someone who's planned the conference and I'm sure Jeff can also echo the sentiment under the best of circumstances, planning a conference it's in a voluntary right. capacity is a nightmare. And for Algerian to have had to do this under these circumstances, um, even to the point where, you know, where he's emailing people late at night, ah, the Zoom rooms aren't working. Can you set up a Zoom room? Like for him to have to be dealing with that while also trying to manage the conference and walking into the NAS presidency um, during a time of increased activism, I'd like, I think, you know, at every session, let's like maybe close out with a round of applause for um, Algerian and for Jeff for the great job they've done holding it together this year. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, hopefully I'll see everybody at later sessions. I did record it. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with the recording now, but um, it, it's on my computer, so it'll go somewhere. Excellent. Thanks so much, Faye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.